In the book of Genesis chapter 26 verse 1, the Bible says there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. So we are not talking about the days of Abraham now. These are the days of Isaac. Okay? All right. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land that I shall tell of thee. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed will I give all these countries. Now, other translations say nations. Are you there? And I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham your father. Now, do you realize that the things that God is telling Isaac here are not new things? That the things he told Abraham previously and he's still committed to them in another generation. Reaffirming the, his commitment to those promises in spite of the fact that a generation has come and gone and there's a new generation on ground, God never changes. His commitment is the same, and he came to reaffirm his commitment to those words that he swore unto his father Abraham. The next thing that the heart of God is filled of are generations. The first thing, what? Nation. Now, the, the question I need to ask you is, how is your prayer life? What, what do you pray for? Because for many people, when we raise prayers about Nigeria, they are bored. They say, how, how am I going to benefit from this whole effort right now? I'm not in government house. I don't hold any political position. If Nigeria gets better, is it not going to be better for the politicians, for the president? For the people in power. How does it affect me? I'm a simple businessman. What I do is buy and sell. And I buy and sell in drought. I buy and sell in good times. And that's what I do. And the presence of the government makes little or no contribution to my estate. That kind of thinking is the thinking of the fallen man, Adam. That kind of thinking is a measure of your life, that your life is still within the context of the self-centered. And if your life is in the context of the self-centered, you cannot fulfill God's dream, which is nations. You are too small, and your perspective is too microscopic. So there is a likelihood that your potentials will not be realized, and that God cannot gain much through the investment he has made on your life. So God needs to do something quickly to your heart in order for him to enlarge your capacity so that you can see in the same way that he sees. Are you with me? All true scriptures, and I took time to do diligent work in my study, I can tell you authoritatively, there are two major headlines that form that which is in the heart of God. And I just said them now. One is, the other is what? So you will see God many generations later. Okay, come with me. Let's do some Bible work. The time is short, and that's why I'm wondering what. All right. Okay. Don't worry, I'll not take your time. Let's go to the New Testament and do some work. Let's do like um, from Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 from verse 13 and verse number 14. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. What is the curse of the law? 
I hope you know those days. Are you with me? If someone should commit a sin and you want that sin dealt with, you need to go to Urukum Wur Market and get a ram. Sacrifice a ram. How much is a ram now? Hey. Is it that we have not been visiting Urukum Market? Is that? Somebody said 5,000. That's, well, that was in 1987. <laughs> 45,000. All right, so. 70,000, a good size. Okay. So you tell lights on Monday, you pay 70,000. You tell lights on Tuesday, you pay 70,000. By the end of the week, you'll be broke. That's the curse of the law. And I'm not sure, even at the end of the week, you would have atoned for all your errors. <laughs> so the law had a requirement that was not sustainable. It will not tell on you if it's just one or two you have sacrificed. By the time you have sacrificed the 18th one, you will know that we are all on that curse. <laughs> the 25th one. You will, you, will, you will sign out. So the Bible says, Christ has redeemed us from the cause of the law, being made a cause for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Part of the reason why the disciples that went back to Emmaus after the death of Jesus went back home to their village they want to pick their life up from where they left it was because of the way Jesus died. Jesus died on a tree. And in the eyes of the Jew, that was hyper significant. It meant Jesus died as a customer. The average Jew cannot believe beyond that point. There were so many ways you could die by blight, by bomb. by pestilence, by sickness and disease, by war, by weapons. But he died on a tree, which meant he died the death of the damned, the death of the cursed. And at that point, no Jew will ever believe that any good thing can come out of that arrangement because there are numerous assortments of ways to die. But the reason why he died that way was so that he can take upon the curse that the law inflicted upon us in his ordinances and requirements. So he took on him that cost status so that the law that was designed to put us in an oscillatory situation that is tantamount to a curse will lose the power to inflict us. So all of the causes that you can imagine are hooked up on Christ such that there is no legal allowance for you to carry a curse again. For Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Be made a curse for us for as it is written, cursed is everyone that hanged on the tree. Next verse is my emphasis. That the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Christ. Can you see the transgenerational connection? So the Bible speaks about the blessings of Abraham. It will interest you to know, are you still here? Are you still here? Stay with me. Stay with me. It will interest you to know that God does not bless individuals. God blesses Abraham. The issue of blessing is with a man. 
and that man is called what? Abraham. Good. The extent to which you partake of that which was given to Abraham is the degree to which you become a descendant of Abraham. The blessings of Abraham will come to you by inheritance. Because God willed the act to Abraham in his transaction with him. And he established that it is through him that all the families of the earth will be blessed. And Abraham in that context was captured as a source. That if you are going to be blessed, you are going to be blessed because of righteous Abraham. Nothing more, nothing less. So the Bible says that there was an arrangement I had with Abraham. And this arrangement I had with Abraham. How many of you still remember when he, he went to free Lot? I don't want to go there to take so, so much time. He went to free Lot. And when after he had freed Lot, freed the guys that were captive, got their goods back, got their gold back, got everything back, with a little militia raised in his house, 318 men, and we don't have time to even talk about the tactics, the strategy of warfare that he adopted in order to you know, ensure recovery. The kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, and the kings of the other nations, Tida, king of nations, came. They came to Abraham with a pro proposal. They said, Abraham, can you keep the goods and give us the souls? And that's what Satan tells every preacher. Keep the goods. Let's have the souls. You can take the money, but ensure that the souls are mine. Do you realize that when Satan showed up in the wilderness to tempt Jesus, it's all right. If you are the son, son of God, turn these stones into bread. That means turn these lively stones. The Bible says we are lively stones. Built up into a spiritual house. So turn these lively stones, make them bread. Convert the people to money. So it's all about market share. The more, the larger the congregation, the more money available. Because all you see when the numbers begin to come is the finances possible in the arrangement. Turn these stones into bread. Satan has... A deal for every man. And when the kings approached Abraham, Abraham said, I, unfortunately for you, I encountered the Most High before you guys showed up with your proposal. And when I encountered the Most High, I lifted up my hands to him. This was the state, what Abraham did. And anybody in this state is in a state of surrender. I had surrendered myself unto the Most High God before you guys came for this proposal. And part of the commitment that I made with God will not allow me to receive anything from you. It guarantees that I'm going to be great, I'm going to be rich. But I don't want it to be said that any of you contributed to that riches because it will take away from the glory of God. So he refused to take a shoe latchet from the spoil because he had an assurance that on the account of that which he had with God, there was no way he would not be a man of greatness. Please help me tell your neighbor, greatness is better than blessing. So the Bible is saying here that in order for us to be adequate inheritors of the blessing that was conferred upon Abraham, we had to be delivered from every form of curse. So, what God did was that he allowed Jesus to die the death of a cursed man so that he can take from you through the principle of substitution that is the wisdom and the strategy that God adopted in acquiring your salvation. You can dump your curses upon him so that you can become eligible to become an inheritor of the blessings of Abraham. You get that? Are you seeing the arrangement? Or oh, you are not seeing the arrangement? You can see. 
And then he didn't stop there through Jesus Christ. So you become eligible to partake of the blessings that were conferred upon Abraham through Jesus Christ. So when you come into Jesus Christ, your curses were taken. Your curses are no longer yours. They belong to Jesus. And the curses were dealt with on the cross. They were nailed to the cross. So it is bound to the cross. It no longer has the capacity to hop from the cross and hop on your life. Justice has already met the curses. Are you still with me? Because someone took them. And no matter how you like curses, if they are taken away, it's no longer yours. And the reason why it was taken is so that you can become eligible to be partakers of the blessings that were conferred upon Abraham. Are you there? That we might receive the substance of the blessing when God blessed Abraham and say, I bless you. What came upon him were not words. Oh, you are not with me. Have you ever seen someone, a powerful minister of the gospel, preaching the gospel, goes to a crippled person and he tells the person, rise up in the name of Jesus. And the person rises up. It's not the word R-I-S-E that entered him. What entered the guy that rose is the spirit. So the compendium that houses the blessings of Abraham is the spirit of God that we have now received through faith. So that's the personality that administers the blessings of God through directives that he gives you. You heard what the pastor said yesterday, that he was fasting, dry fasting on his face in, one, in the cabin of one of the vessels they went to for offshore assignments. And I tell you, I'm a witness that in the kitchen of those vessels, you have all kinds of meals. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. <laughs> I've ate Russian food. I ate Pakistani food. I ate Filipino food. I ate Indian food. There's Jesus and many more that I can't even remember now. Because when you come there, there are 12 different kinds of food. You will see Fanta that you have never seen before is in that place. That was where the guy was fasting. You will not know how much fasting we did and left food. Food! Food! You just see one chicken. The way they cook it, if you, when you see it, you will know it's, this one is sweet, but you are fasting. You are fasting. You see, remember what, what happened to him. He was face down, fasting, calling upon the Lord. And the Lord gave him wisdom. He said, your, your wealth is in health and safety. It's the Spirit of God that we administer the wisdom that will stir that blessing upon your life through direction. And that's why when you see a man that God wants to help, what the Holy Spirit does to him is that he gives him direction. When you see a man that lacks direction, even though he may be anointed, he's going nowhere. There is a spirit that we received. And in this spirit, are all the dimensions of the blessing of Abraham that have been given unto us. It means that in my life right now, there are no causes that are active. Every cause I was supposed to walk in, inclusive of the cause of the law, they were hung on the man on the tree. So that I will be, I can be, as a Gentile, a, an eligible candidate to tap into the commonwealth of the blessings that were conferred upon Abraham and his descendants. So based on this arrangement, Abraham has two, string, two strands of, a, of, of, of descendants. There were biological descendants that were sons of Abraham, and there were spiritual descendants that hooked up to the covenant by faith because he was the father of faith. He was a friend of God. And he was the father of many nations. And today, Jews, 
Muslims, Christians, call Abraham their ancestor. And because the gene and the DNA of greatness is in Abraham, even the sons of the bond woman became great. Abraham's little mistake became a great thing. Little mistake. He met with Hagar. Because the DNA of greatness was, was in him. The problem that came out was a great problem. Are you still with me? So can you see the transgenerational nature? Christ was doing something. And the reason why he was doing it, people did not understand until the spirit of revelation came to unveil it. He was doing it to connect us to something many generations. So God is both obsessed about nations and about generations. And if you do not have the spirit of wisdom and revelation, you will never know where God is headed in your life. Because when a spirit is at work in you, your understanding will be unfruitful. Why are you suffering all these things? Is, this guy is not suffering. See that lady. She's not righteous. She's not suffering. Oh, you will not know what is working out. And the people that your life will connect to, the people through whom uh, that your life will bring into the economy of God, it, it, it's, it's something beyond your intelligence that is at work. Because God's eyes see the potential that your life will create for the kingdom of God. When you see it this way, then you can understand the book of Psalms 2 verse 8. Give me 2 verse 8, Psalms 2 verse 8 on the board. Let's start the issue of praying for nations. I will take you deep to show you what makes a nation. What makes a nation is not the population statistics that you see on Google. What makes a nation is not her politics. Every day in Nigeria, there's something about politics that must make the headlines. And you will think it is politics that makes a nation. You would think it's a story of the kings that ascend the place of the saddle of responsibility that make a nation. And so men die to climb into power because in their mind, they are part of the making of nations. You are wrong. This is the prayer of sons, men that have grown to understand the mind of God and the ways of God. They do not ask for things because if you are in alignment, seeking first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, the things that the Gentiles seek, they will navigate in your direction. Prosperity is the result of alignment. We, we, I think we did a Bible study like that. If I'm sold out to God and I'm consumed in God, my life is spent to achieve God's dream. God will ensure that I have the resources I need to fulfill my divine assignment. That is the story of prosperity in the Bible. But so many preachers have made it a goal. This is what you run after so that you have some coins, so that you can say you have two master's degree, so that you can say you have four vehicles packed in your garage. Life is never mundane. The one that is behind all of these things that your eyes can see is a spirit being. So when we become real sons of the kingdom, we ask what the father is seeing. We ask for it. He said, ask of me. And I will give thee the hidden. Give me another translation quickly. I don't know when last you asked for, for Germany. All the nations we are entering today, in 2008, when we married, we prayed. In fact, we went and bought the map of the world. And your wife brought the map of the world so that we can 
pray for nations. Only ask and I will give you the nations as your inheritance and the whole earth as your possession. I don't have time to take you into the content of nations. Not today. The content. What makes a nation? And I assure you it's not his politics. It's not his demographics. It's not his flag. It's not the color and the power of his passport. Nations. And that's one of the reasons why we must take the Project Nigeria seriously. Because at the time in which we live, Satan wants to play a fast one on us. He has agents littered across places of influence. And they want to do their worst to see that the destiny of this nation as ordained by God is thwarted. But there was a parable that Jesus gave to Saul when he was on his way to Damascus. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? For it is hard to kick against the priests. What's the meaning of that? What we set up in eternity, you cannot undo in time. If you attempt to undo it, it will be as good as putting yourself in harm's way. It is hard to kick against the barbed wire. And I tell the enemies of Nigeria, it is hard to kick against the barbed wire because God has spoken over this land and his words will stand. It is hard. If you were not there in the studio, when God conceived the vision for the people that will possess these lands, there is nothing that you can do to truncate the agenda of the omnipotent. Oh my God, this parable will be seen in Nigeria in our days. What happens to a man that kicks against the pricks? Men will be destroyed because of the attempt to thwart the agenda that God has for this nation. This nation is bigger than any man. It's bigger than any tribe. It's bigger because there is an agenda that is locked in it. I don't have time to take you into the substance, the stuff of nations. Then you will see that there are things trapped in nations beyond her politics. And just in case you see a man die in the height of influence, when it was as though he had the power to wield the direction of the land and he suddenly dies, it is because of the content of the nation that he was seeking to manipulate that he was cut off. And in the story of Nigeria, many strong have been cut off in their prime when they held on to the front seat to stir the nation because they are not aware that what is in a nation is deep. And it is because it is deep that it fills the heart of God. Are you here today? He said, ask of me. I want to lead us tonight to ask of him. If you give me 15 minutes, I will take you deeper. All right, Romans 9. When I come to continue this lecture, because I want to show us how to pray for nations, that's just the objective. When I come to continue the lecture, I'm going to take you far. You become wise. Even when you stand and speak, not because... God spoke to you. You just understand the context. Your words will be so close to prophecy because you know the pillar of nations. Give me Romans chapter 9. Ima Musai Kobakule. We'll begin our reading from verse number 4. 
Romans 9, 4. He said, who are the Israelites? We are using a test case. Are you there? This is a test case. Who are the Israelites? Number one, to whom pertained the adoption? Are you there? That's number one. I'm going to explain. I will explain what adoption means. Number two, to whom pertained the glory? Number three, to whom pertained the covenant? And the giving of the law? And the service of God? And the promises? Are you there? So if you are elected president of Israel, and you want to, you are bent on derailing the destiny of the nation because you think political power is equivalent to nation. Meanwhile, in that nation, there is something more ancient than your grandfather's called the adoption that God, by an act of his will, decided to choose this nation. Are you there? <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you are president. The reason why you will die in power it's because you are fighting against the power of what? Of the adoption. And very soon you'll be taught a bitter lesson that the kings of old had to learn by fire. How many of you still remember when Belshazzar sent men to go into the sanctuary where the spoil that they got from the victories of many nations were gathered and requested because they were doing a party. The party had entered into the sixth month. So they wanted to do something new to sustain the spectacle. And they requested, he requested that the vessel from the house of the God of Israel should be brought and they want to drink from the vessel of the gods. Unfortunately for him, when a vessel or an item is brought into the house of God, the priest will conduct a ritual and anoint the vessels. The moment the anointing touches that vessel, it can no longer be used for any mundane use. It's just that you, like you take a goat to swim in the morning, swim. That's when we, we want to hail you. We remember you. Take good. And then in the evening, you now discover there's lack of meat in your house. You run back to the shrine and say, Swim. You know what? I changed my mind. The goat you are taking from there is loaded. <laughs> the next set of calamities that you will have is because you committed trespass. Those cups, those vessels, we already anointed and they only have one exclusive purpose to be used in the service of God. And this guy, because he was king, a political leader, now sends for them and says, get them, let's drink from the sanctified vessels of the God of Israel. While he was still drinking and they were drinking, a half hand appeared. His judgment was written in the runes of a language that even the best scholars have not been able to decipher. It was a cipher that exceeded the algorithm of metaverse. He wrote, Mene, Mene, Teke, Ufasi, and all the Chaldeans the astrologers, the magicians, the sorcerers lacked the ability to read the language and none of them could even lie about it. Because if you start lying with one alphabet, you will see a similar alphabet somewhere. You need to make the same sound and the meaning might not correlate. So they didn't know it and they couldn't successfully lie about it. His judgment was written in an ancient rune. 
And when Daniel came and interpreted it, it was the end of his kingdom. The kingdom of many men will end because they do not know the meaning of nations. And when intercessors rise in the land that understand the pillars of the civilization among the people and they cry, oh, the God of nations will arise. When he arises, he begins with judgment. He begins with justice. For instance, Nigeria has lingered like a donkey without, without direction. And no justice has been factored in her all these years. It will continue like that until the sons of the kingdom ask for the nations. Part of what makes a nation are the covenants that exist in it. Part of what makes a nation are the prophecies that the prophets raised in those lands spoke about the destiny of that nation and what that nation means before God. Nigeria is a corporate persona. The missionary of the end time. Our merchandise is revival. The words of our ancient prophets have captured our place in the presence of God. The end of our land, our nation, will not be by the hand of a man. The sons of the born woman will not bring us into captivity because there is something that is planted in the heart of our civilization. It is the reason for which we have not divided all this while. Even though politically when you look at the terrain, division seems to be the answer. But there is a hand that has resisted it. Not because the leaders have been patriotic. There's something that has defied politics that is in charge. The Americans predicted that when we, we hit a hundred years, we were going to fossilize and fragment in so many different ways. They, they forecasted a war that will consume us. And they watched from afar and saw the marvel. Concerning Nigeria, even the wives have been made mad. There is something in the land. I don't have time. There is something in the land. Our end is not near. But our destiny is about to begin. We just arrived maturity. You see, no priest steps into service until he arrives the age of 30. About nations, every nation has a time. For instance, concerning Israel, what happened when 70 people journeyed into Egypt? Because 70 is the number of nations. Go and count. You'll find that the number of people that migrated into Egypt were 70. And that was artificial insemination that took place. And we, because Egypt was to be the womb that would bear that nation, and the gestation period was for 400 years. And after that gestation period is accomplished, a man child will come out of Israel. It will be fully, fully endowed, and Egypt will be compelled to forcefully deliver that man child. All the metaphors, the blood, the judgments are all the signs you find in childbirth. And the last sign is that the water will break. And that was what happened at the Red Sea. A nation was born. And that was what the prophet Isaiah spoke about. Shall a nation be born at once? Egypt, her king was considered to be a deity. His crown was in the shape of a cobra that was set to strike. He was enthroned by the sun God. It means that as long as his, the sun rises, his dominion will continue. The gods of Egypt were judged in the day 
that the counsel of God was to come to pass about the nation of Israel. Oh, who knew that any power existed that could challenge the strength of Anubis, the gods of Egypt? That's the god of the underworld. It is Anubis that gave the inspiration about them, the embalmment of the kings of Egypt. That they were embalmed and their tombs were in gold. It was his whisper that by so doing you could preserve the soul of a traveler into eternity. That he will find light where darkness is. And all the attendant philosophies that came. But Jesus was not a philosopher. He was thrown into the dead. Was thrown into death. He was in Hades. And without your prayer and my prayer. He arose from the dead. You didn't pray for him. I don't have time tonight. But I tell you what is hidden in the land is stronger than the name of kings. Oh my God. As sons of Zion tonight, we will pray for Nigeria. And what I'm doing today is by instruction. And the Lord will answer. Oh my. Kings were judged because they were not careful to know the meaning of the nations that they governed. There was something bigger than their throne that was at stake. They either rose or died on the strength of their knowledge or lack of knowledge as the case may be. Today we are going to pray for Nigeria. The utterances of our prophets have revealed our destiny. That we are going to be that nation in which the throne of righteousness from heaven will be planted. For Pa Elton said, that a season of righteousness will come. The throne of the Christ. Manifesting righteousness. Have you heard of the scripture that says that throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. For the scepter of thine kingdom is a right scepter. Yeah, that scepter will be planted here. That is a scepter that will displace the principalities of the occult, the principalities of corruption that have eaten into the fabric of our land. There is something that will be planted here. Our ancestors prophesied it. That a time will come. The righteousness of God will spring from the heart of our land. Oh my God. If you feel it the way I do, then you need to be on your feet right now. The reason why I cry is because that time has come that the throne of heaven might sit and blaze with great righteousness and fire and purge the land from its darkness. Ah. Can we, can we, can we cry tonight as a Lord? In the name of Jesus Christ, plant the seed of righteousness. Let that throne of righteousness be planted in the heart of Nigeria. That throne that will wage war against darkness, wage war against the spirit of the occult, against the spirit of corruption that is feeding fat on the resources of our land. As the prophet says, it will be all over the world. There is a mighty revelation of the glory of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea, the merchandise that God has given us as a nation is called revival. That is what we are going to traffic in. We are going to transport it from place to place. Kindle the fires of nations. Consume the darkness in the territories. There's a mighty revelation of the glory of the Lord. Samonde Lim 
man. Oh yeah. Oh, that's a mighty, mighty revelation. Yes, Lord, has a water. It means that men can plan, but except God sanctions it, it will never come to pass. Can we pray and say, Lord, can you dethrone the plans of men, plans of demons, plans of principalities, plans of evil people? Dethrone them in Nigeria. Dethrone them in Nigeria. Dethrone them in, in Nigeria. Dethrone them, dethrone them. I can't hear your voice. I can't hear your voice. They thrown them. They thrown the plans, the machinations. They thrown them concerning Nigeria. Concerning Nigeria. They thrown them. Oh yes. Oh yes. It shall not come to pass. It shall not stand. It shall not stand. All over the world, the spirit is moving. All over the world, as the prophet said, it should be. All over the world, there's a man.
Lord, tonight we know that beyond the plans of the wicked concerning Nigeria, beyond the financial support that the wicked has to actualize their wickedness over the nation, beyond the funding, beyond the backing, we know that you sit in the circles of the earth and you are governor among the nations. And no man can speak a thing and it comes to pass except you allow it. So concerning Nigeria, we ask tonight, arise, arise, and let your enemies be scattered. Let the people that have teamed up together to bring the nation down begin to fight among themselves Amen. and kill themselves Amen. and destroy themselves Amen. in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. By all means, save Nigeria. Save our nation. Remember your promise to our ancestors, the prophets. Remember the words of encouragement that came through their ministry. Remember the prayers that have ascended into your courts concerning this nation, generation after generation. Intercessors that were never visible, that were on the mountains and in the woods, calling upon your name. Men that your spirit moved over and quickened them to stand in the gap concerning the nation. Remember their tears, their fasting, their prayer, and the promises you gave them on the platform of sacrifice. And we call you tonight to remember and arise. Remember and arise. Remember and arise. Remember and arise. Remember and arise in the name of Jesus. Let your hand of judgment be unleashed. That from today, this night, let the hand of your judgment be unleashed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name.